So the Arminian after Arminius I'm going to talk about is John Wesley. John Wesley, as I mentioned before, was an Englishman. So he was born into the Church of England in the 1700s, and he became a priest in the Church of England. He um, was a lifelong Anglican. That's what we call people who are part of the Church of England. But as I noted before, Wesley was very concerned that the Church of England um, had become lax, that people weren't deeply engaged in their religion, that they went through the motions, but they didn't really care. And so he, while he was um, at Oxford, began to meet with a group of friends, and they would um, go through these, these questions about their spiritual disciplines. Are you reading the Bible? Are you praying? Are you serving the poor? And people accused him of having a method, and that's how they came to have the name Methodist. So Wesley was part of the Church of England, which again had some Calvinist influences, but also some more Catholic influences. He also lived during a time where there was a sort of rediscovery of some of the Greek thinkers, from the people um, like the people we've talked about from the early part of the church, and he became highly influenced by their writings. So what does Wesley say about um, predestination and free will and the Christian life more generally? Well, he, like everybody we've talked about in the Western tradition, um, does believe in original guilt. Um, he's part of the Augustinian tradition, at least to that extent. And he believes that original sin wounds everybody. Everybody has the problem of original sin that we are um, broken, that we cannot um, fix ourselves. But what he said is that grace, which he really understood as God's presence, God being with you, allows everyone the possibility of free will. And here it's sort of Augustinian, sort of not in the sense. And he really means here kind of free choice. You can choose the good um, because of God's presence. So he's not saying that you can choose the good on your own. He's not Pelagian. He's not saying that there's just an example for you to follow. He's saying that God has given everyone what he called prevenient grace, great, this first grace that's for everybody um, that restores you to enough health, spiritual health, that you are able to move towards God. But again, only because God has moved towards you. He is a good Protestant, and so he says, like Luther and like Calvin, that justification is not dependent on sanctification. So, in other words, when you have this prevenient grace, you say, yes, I'm a sinner, I need salvation, you are justified. God says, I um, acknowledge you as being in right relationship with me. However, for Wesley... Sanctification was necessary, with some caveats. What Wesley said is this, if you are justified, if you were the thief on the cross next to Jesus dying with him, and you say, Lord, I believe you, and then you die, justification is all you need. But for Wesley, for most of us, um, we have time after justification to become holier. And he said that that is, in fact, part of what you needed to do. Another way of saying this is that Wesley was apt to talk about sin and salvation in terms of sickness and healing. Sin is sickness, salvation is healing. And so he would say, you know, you are justified when God says, I will heal you. But you then really do need to get better. Um, the point of salvation is the getting better. And if you aren't actively engaged in what he called the means of grace, um, again, Bible reading, prayer, going to church, for Wesley, very importantly, serving the poor, then you're not getting healed. And at some point, you just don't have a relationship with God. You can't sort of rest on your laurels and think, well, I'm justified, so I'm good. If you're not actively pursuing sanctification, holiness, healing, those are basically interchangeable terms for Wesley, then you're not being saved because holiness, healing, sanctification is the point of salvation. Um, Wesley even took that a little further. He talked about the possibility of something he called entire 
sanctification. Wesley taught that it was possible to come to a point where you were able to perfectly love God. He said that you could get to a point in human life where you would not willingly transgress a known law of God. You might unwillingly do it, or you might transgress an unknown law of God, but basically you could get to a point where you were, had been so filled with the love of God that you would not act out of something that wasn't love of God. This is something that both Luther and Calvin would not say. They would see a much greater role for the continuing presence of sin in human life. They would probably say that the um, formula of not willingly transgressing a known law of God gives far too many caveats. They just wouldn't have been really interested in uh, Wesley's idea. They would have wanted to emphasize more the ongoing problem of sin in people's life. But Wesley said that this was important because it was a biblical doctrine. At one point, Jesus said to his disciples that they should be perfect as their Father in heaven was perfect. And Wesley said that Jesus' commands were um, covered promises, meaning if God asked us to do something, that God would make it possible for us to do. So if God asked for perfection, then it was possible. Now, Wesley never claimed this perfection for himself. Um, he had an estranged wife who probably would have just said that that was ridiculous if he had made the claim. Um, but he did say there were people that he knew, that he knew in the Methodist movement, who had reached this state where they were so filled with the love of God that they would not act out of anything but that love. So again, here, what's important for Wesley in terms of predestination and you read this in his text, is he thinks that predestination um, says bad things about God. It makes God seem ungracious because God isn't giving grace to everyone. It, where places in the Bible where it says that God wills the salvation of all people, Wesley said that makes God a liar because obviously if predestination is true and some are damned, then God doesn't will the salvation of all people. He didn't, however, want to say that people could earn salvation on their own or that they should try to do that, his way of doing this was, again, talking about this prevenient grace, which meant that he had ultimately a very different idea of sovereignty than, say, John Calvin did. Um, for Wesley, God could be sovereign, and God was sovereign for Wesley, and yet things could happen that God did not want. People could act in ways that were opposed to God, and Wesley thought you could hold that together with the sovereignty of God, that God ultimately would get what God wants um, in terms of um, the history working out the way God wanted, but that individuals could make choices opposed to what God would want. However, all people had the opportunity by responding to God's grace to um, be saved, and then they could continue living in that life, and, and again, needed to continue living holy lives in disciplines in order to really experience that salvation. Wesley always believed his theology was closer to Calvin than to Luther. He recognized that he and Calvin disagreed on predestination, but because Calvin emphasized sanctification, which was really um, Wesley's big, big emphasis, um, he always believed that he was closer to Calvin than to Luther. Um. And here's a little bit on John Wesley on Providence. So the question then comes, you know, if God is sovereign, um, why do bad things happen? This is a good question right now. Um, and here's a little bit of what Wesley, Wesley says. Only he that can do all things else cannot deny himself. He hears God, cannot counteract himself or oppose his own work. Were it not for this, he would destroy all sin with its attendance pain at any moment. He would abolish wickedness out of his whole creation and suffer not a trace of it remain. But in doing so, he would counteract himself. He would altogether overturn his own work and undo all that he had been doing since he created man upon the earth. For God created man in his image, a spirit like himself, a spirit endued with understanding, with will or affections and liberty, without which neither his understanding nor his affections could have been of any use. Neither would he have been capable either of vice or virtue. He, here, humans, would not be a moral agent any more than a tree or a stone. If their God were thus to exert his power, there would be certainly no more vice, but as equally certain, neither could there be any virtue in the world. 
were human liberty taken away, men would be as incapable of virtue as stones. So in other words, for Wesley, providence doesn't mean that God controls every action. It can't mean that. Um, it certainly can mean that God brings evil, or good out of evil. But for Wesley, if God were to simply make everything that God wanted to have happen, God would be overruling human freedom, human liberty, and we would be, he doesn't use this language, but we would basically be robots. And that wouldn't be virtue. Um, it would just be being controlled by the robot maker. So Wesley says that God does exercise providence. Again, God is powerful. God can help move history in the right direction. God is with us. God is present. God is acting. But God is not controlling humanity's every move. All right, here is our chart again. Um, I put Luther there at the bottom just for a point of comparison. Um, for Wesley and Calvin, different emphases in the doctrine of God. Uh, Calvin emphasizes the sovereign God, the powerful God. Wesley really, the, what he would consider the gracious God. Calvin would want to say his God is gracious too, but, but this is a huge emphasis for um, Wesley. Wesley would say that God is sovereign, but he understands sovereignty in a different way. Um, both Calvin and Wesley really see Jesus as a substitute. They are probably more, um, particularly Calvin has that um, forensic or legal understanding of the atonement. Um, but Wesley really focuses on the healing dimension of salvation. Both believe in original guilt. Both believe in total depravity. Um, but again, Wesley emphasizes not just that, but sin and sickness that we need to be healed from. For Calvin, right relationship comes through election and grace, which we do not choose. It's completely from God. God justifies the elect. The elect persevere. That's not how you spell preserve. I guess they, I don't know, it should be persevere. And largely obey the law. Um, that's what it means to be elect. For Wesley, right relationship with God comes through the human response to provenient grace. So human response to what God has offered, to God's presence, um, it's a graced response, but it is an actual human response. It's a response we're able to make because of grace. If you're thinking this sounds a little bit like Aquinas, it does. Um, God wants to justify everyone. Right relationship involves healing, being made well. And so justification really usually means sanctification. If you're not on the process to becoming holy for Wesley, you're missing the point of salvation. That salvation means being, being healed of sin and entire sanctification for Wesley is possible. It doesn't happen for everyone, but it's possible. Um, in graduate school, I did a paper on John Wesley and found that in his um, theology, there are hints that he believed that even after death, people who are saved, he did believe in a hell, so not everybody for Wesley was, but for people who are saved, there is a continual growth in love. He suggested that you could spend eternity um, growing in love for God and never exhaust that love. So this, this sanctification, this becoming holier, becoming more and more loving could literally continue through eternity and not um, reach its limit for Wesley.